If it's, if it's your first time here, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Brian. I'm the pastor here, and we're really glad that everyone's here today. But if you're here for the first time, you're catching us right in the middle of something. The whole um, this whole uh, springtime, basically starting in January, leading up into the summer, we've been studying the Book of John, and we do a chapter a week, um, and each week is kind of its own little piece, but it really fits into a bigger story. So, And especially like this one, like chapter 15 just kind of ends because I guess they decided it needed to. And chapter 16 is like this, the second half of the sentence. It's like it kind of just keeps going. So this is really just a piece of a bigger p- puzzle. And so I want you to think about that, check that out. But we're into an interesting part of this where this is Jesus' farewell discourse where a lot of it was, you know, narrative where it's like they went over here and then they did this and they went over here and they met this guy. And, you know, that's a certain way you talk about that. And then now what we've got from chapters about 13 to 17, there's this chunk where Jesus is literally just giving them the business. Like he's sitting the guys down and saying, hey, I'm about to die. So here's some things you need to know. And that's like a different. Like, first off, what an awesome thing to have. Like if you could go, gosh, I wish I could just sit down with God and have him tell me the most important things. You kind of got a good list here to start with, all right? And I think that uh, in a lot of ways, these are pretty easy to understand what he's saying, meaning like he says things pretty clearly, you know, and that's what we're going to encounter today. It's not like you go, wow, what did he mean by that? I mean, a lot of this stuff is pretty straightforward, but the depth of it is pretty deep. So it's not to say like you'll just understand everything in the moment. And the reason I'm bringing all that up is we do send out an email every day, Pastor Kevin does, uh, called the Everyday. And it's an email. I have a slide up there if you want to put that up, the link. That if you if you don't sign up for this, you can put your point your phone at this and you'll get these emails. And what he does is he breaks down the these chapters into daily chunks that you can kind of reflect on and he helps you kind of guide through that. Because you need to think about some of these more than you will have the chance of as I breeze through them today. Okay. Easy to understand, but not always easy to live out or put into practice. You really need to think about these as we go. And so today we're on John 15, and this is a famous passage where Jesus refers to himself as the vine and the branches. And so that's what I decided to to call it. So I'm just going to read and make some comments as we go along. So John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch... In me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So first couple notes, Jesus is the vine here, not us. And that, you know, As American people, I think we tend to like to think of the world revolving around us, and that's just natural. I mean, we probably have a pretty bad case of it, but everybody thinks like that. Like every single thing I have experienced in my entire life and every single thing you've experienced in your entire life, you're the sin, like everything I've experienced, I've been involved in and I've, you know, I've seen through my eyes. And I, so it's hard for me to not start to interpret the world as revolving around me because everything I've ever done has me in the center of it. But then I encounter you and you're the same way. And, every, you know, all this kind of thing. The, the truth is the world does revolve around Jesus. And so it's good for us to get that because he's using here a symbol. This is an ancient symbol that would refer to Israel. So he's kind of, he's like, he's the full embodiment of Israel. He's again, reminding us as he has in the chapters before, he's like, I am Israel's God. And that God, I am the Messiah, the savior of the entire world. Israel's God is the true God, the true God who I've come to redeem all of humanity. But he's making this point very clear. But he's also making the point that we aren't divine. He's divine. We're not divine. Okay. And he starts to get pretty intense really quick. Not that if you're a branch, as we are, you're going to get cut somehow. If you're not fruit bearing, you get cut off bad. If you are fruit bearing, you get cut to be more better. Okay? So either way, you're going to get cut. (laughs) And uh, that's not a pleasant experience, but it's good for us. But when you start to say uh, fruit, what are we talking about here? Um, the, uh, the, the, fir- if you're like me and you kind of grew up in the church world, you sort of go, well, he's, I have just, he's probably talking about evangel, even like evangelistic fruit. Like, am I bringing the fruit of sharing my faith with other people? And I would say that's probably, you could include that in here, but it's not actually most directly what he's talking about. He's talking here more about 
what we might call moral fruit, or in this context, we'll call it the fruit of the Spirit, as we are used to. And so, when he's saying, if you don't bear fruit, bearing fruit, what does that fruit look like? Well, in Galatians 5.22, you see this list of the fruit of the Spirit, um, and it says this, but, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So that's Galatians. You just write that down. I think in our day and age, this is a list we need to keep close at hand. The fruit of the Spirit that Jesus is talking to us, like that we will, <laughs> that we will produce when we abide in him, is this list of things. It does probably include all the other fruit of your entire life, including your evangelical fruit and including the fruit of your life. Like if you have children and you're parenting or if you're working a job, I mean, every single thing you do will bear fruit, but none of it will fit outside the boundary of this umbrella here. This is the fruit of the Spirit. You see what I'm saying? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And it doesn't, you, don't, you don't need me to tell you that we don't see a whole lot of that in our world these days, or any days, but this is, these are the days. So let's continue where he's going. So he's, he's the vine, we're the branches. We're, that, re, that relationship causes these types of things to show up in our life. <clears throat> so he says this, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He's saying it again. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And now, here's the kind of clincher here. Apart from me, you can do all right. No, that's not what he says, is it? A lot of us think, apart from him, we can probably do pretty stinking good. You know, I mean, I need him to, to, to finish it off, but I'm not doing too bad by myself. He says here, apart from me, you can do nothing. It's good to keep this clear. Jesus is not being mean. He's just telling you like it is. He's giving them the business of saying. He's like, apart from me, you can do nothing. You need to know that because it's true, not because you're a bad person or whatever. It's just because that's the truth. We are a branch, and branches don't work by themselves. This is the thing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Not something, not most things, nothing. Verse 6, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Now, is that the kind of branch that you want to be? Answer is no. I'm going to use Pastor Jeff's oft-used um, uh, picture just because, I mean, we're, we're seriously in that. You, you take these two branches here, and you say, what's the difference between these two? And people go, well, that one's dead, and that one's alive. Well, the truth is, they're both dead. This one's just further along. So the difference is time. And a lot of us, because, like, all of us, every person would go, that's a dead branch. The bigger problem is this. We're around a lot of people, and oftentimes we'll fool ourselves. We're like, well, look at me. I'm so pretty good. You know? And, you, and, you know, this is my Sunday self. You know, like, I can stick it in a little water, and it'll stick around for a while. Point is, once you're cut off, you're done. You're right? It's just in a matter of time. And... <clears throat> I think it might bear repeating also that you could miss in the metaphor, like, you know, he's like, I'm the vine, y'all are the branches. I mean, if this was a southern Bible, he would say something like that. It was, he says that, you know, y'all are the branches. So guess what else is on the tree or the vine of Jesus? Other branches. Sometimes they get in your way. I know. Point is, branches don't work by themselves. They just die. And then they get thrown away and, and burned. But Jesus is not ending in, like, the bad side. He's saying, remain in me so you don't end up like that. Seven, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is one of those easy things, easy to understand, but, like, hard to go, wait a minute, what? Ask, for any, what, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So this is a thing you need to go and pray and reflect on. What does everything, or what does anything mean? What is Jesus talking about in the glory of God? Like, remember, he's doing impressive things, m- miraculous things, all because they're the kind of things that God does. He says this throughout John. He's just doing what the Father does. And now he wants us to do the same thing, and it would include miraculous things. 
But it also, he's talking about bearing much fruit for the Father's glory. And this is the kind of fruit that we were talking about. So you take that one and ponder it for a while. As a father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Again, we, we, this happened a couple of chapters ago. This is another repeat. Keeping his commands is equal to loving him. They don't, they're not separable. So you can't go like, well, I love Jesus, but I don't like to do what he says to do. You know, that's really what you're kind of arguing for. And it's like, no, that doesn't exist. If you love him, you keep his commands. If you don't keep his commands, you don't love him. End of story. Again, he's making it pretty plain here. My command is this. Love each other, the other branches, as I have loved you. And this is a pretty famous verse here, too. This, this, this chapter is full of a lot of famous verses. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. This is loaded stuff here. So Jesus is telling us to love as he has loved. And we, that means loving God and loving each other. And he's, when he's talking about the greatest form of love, he's starting to give a picture of what he's going to do on the cross. He's like saying, you're my friends, guys, and I'm going to die for you. You're my friends, and that's the greatest show of love. But he's also saying, and it ties all into taking up our cross and following him, that giving our lives for other people, even literally or figuratively, meaning every day, giving our lives for other people is the greatest form of love. Jesus just says this here. So some of us that are doing things that are the most giving might feel like often failures or just, I don't know, none important. And Jesus just said that's the greatest form of love that exists, to give our lives for someone else. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I learned from my father I have made known to you. That says Jesus calling his followers friends. He's speaking to an immediate group of people, but if we're going to apply the branches and stuff to us, which I think we totally should and can, this includes us as well. This is God saying that he considers you to be a friend. You need to ponder that. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, again, fruit of the Spirit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, again, there's that again, my Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Again, so that's like a recap of all the last couple sections that we've read. Then he moves on, though. This is interesting. If the world hates you, okay, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. For they do not know the one who sent me. So Jesus is saying we're called out of the world. And we no longer belong to the world. And the world's reaction to that is to hate us as his followers. And it's something he's experiencing. And it's something he's saying we're going to experience. That's a pretty heavy thing to really think about. Especially in a day and age where we like everybody to like us. I mean, we literally post things online and the response is like it's very difficult to, like, there's not a hate button. I mean, if, well, actually, I don't know if there is. I haven't been on Facebook in a while. But if there was, people would probably use it. But is there a dislike button? That's ridiculous. <laughs> I want to be like a nobody asked you button. Any, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll move on. If I had not come, <laughs> uh, sometimes I think I'm funnier than I really am. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me, whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. Now, this is, this is pretty complex stuff that I'm going to breeze over because I have something I want to share with you at the end of this. 
Jesus is exposing the world's sin. He does it to us. He does it to the world, the systems of the world, systemic things, personal things, private things. His presence exposes these things, and people don't like that because we like to keep things hidden. And just his presence and his truthfulness and even his love is overwhelming to people, and they hate that. But what they're really showing is that they hate God and God's rule in their life. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. I want to do it my way, not God's way. It's the same thing over and over again. This last piece I want you to remember, verse 25. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. Hated me without reason. Now, I'm not saying this because I'm thinking of individuals in this room. Okay, I just want to be clear. But as a pastor who has a responsibility to individuals in this room, and we're in the world, I want to make something known to you right now for your own benefit, okay? It's a very important distinction that he's hated without reason, okay? And he's making, that's a reference to the Psalms, Psalm 35. He's kind of quoting there. And it's an important, it's, it's just like those other things. This was done to fulfill the prophecy. This is, this is prophetic fulfillment. And Jesus is saying, we will be like this, followers of him hated without reason. Without reason. Now, this is, what I'm saying to you now is this. There's a lot of people, a lot of Christian leaders in the last little while. We don't need to get into names, but they are leading us, or we see them, and they influence us. This is why I'm giving you a warning. There seems to be a memo. I didn't get it, but there seems to be a memo that being a faithful Christian person means being a big jerk in public, and then when people react negatively to it, you just say the world's hating you or persecuting you just like they did Jesus. And I'm like, or it could be that you're being a jerk. Now, where that line is, I'm not going to sit, sit here and parse through all of those kinds of things. But I am just saying the without reason part is incredibly important. Because if we're living a life, go put the second fruit of the Spirit slide up there. Um. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you live a life, like you said, against these things there's no law, but if you live a life that's producing these fruits, some of the world will hate you because of it, because they hated Jesus who was producing this. But go, go to the next one. I highlighted here. That kindness, gentleness, and self-control are non-negotiable fruit of the Spirit that Jesus requires of us. That would be antithesis of being a jerk, Okay. So pol- we should police ourselves accordingly. And also, frankly, I don't know how you hold accountable. But it doesn't really matter. But I'm saying not be influenced by Christian leaders who aren't following that. They're not being kind, gentle, or in- ex- exhibiting self-control. That's not the kind of fruit that Jesus is talking about. And people reacting to that, people of the world, people that are walking about in darkness, seeing that and going, you know, geez, guys, if that's what being a Christian is about, then I don't want to have anything to do with it. And they go, well, they're just persecuting me like they persecuted Jesus. Don't buy into this narrative, okay? We are called to live this life and have people hate us and us love them back. That's it. Non-negotiable requirement. And how you do that, that's impossible. I understand that. That's why Jesus, the next part. The work of the Holy Spirit is the, height, the title in my Bible here. When the advocate comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you must also, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So, again, like I said, this is a part of a thing. Chapter 16 next week is going to go right into this, and he's talking a whole lot about, you know, being kicked out of synagogues and also the power of the Holy Spirit necessary in a believer's life. And it's also repeating stuff we just read in chapter 14. You can't Live this Christian fruit-filled life plugged into Jesus without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You just can't do it. It's not like you can just try harder to be self-controlled or something like that. It just doesn't work this way. It's a miracle. It's something that God does. And you need to hear the next part, chapter 16, for it to make sense. But I finished quickly today because I wanted to um, invite someone up here to share. Uh, A long-term member of our church reached out to me 
about John 15, and we met and we talked about it, and he has a testimony that ties into this that he wanted to share, and when we talked about it, I said, yeah, I think you should come up here. So, Ryan, why don't you come up here? This is Ryan Pettis. Some of you haven't seen him in a long time because he's been, they've been attending mostly online. <laughs> at this, Yeah, this satellite location. I want to make you help with the stream starting soon, so. But he's going to share a testimony based on this, so I wanted you to hear it. So, Ryan Pettis, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, Brian and I agreed to sort of maybe tag team this, and it's sort of semi-testimony, semi-finishing uh, this off, maybe. Um, but as Brian says, um, if you've been here uh, over the last two years, you almost assuredly haven't seen me. And if I'm being honest, even before that, you might not have noticed me because I sit over there and I don't tend to like to interact with other humans all that much. But I, I've actually been going here 17 years, like he says. So my family has been going here. I know it's been 17 years because my son Ethan is getting ready to be the first Maranatha slash OCF kid to go from crib to college. So he, he started his life here sleeping through service in a crib. He almost slept through service this morning, but we made him in here as a 17-year-old. He'll be off to college. And we, I, I spoke about it. It seems like a cool thing, not for me, but in the life of the church. You know, we've been here this long doing this. And we've got kids who have been raised in, in the life of the church and in Jesus for that long, and that it's, it's, it's a pretty cool thing for the, for the church, I think. Um, thank you. He appreciates interacting with humans as much as I do, so grab him and pinch his cheeks on your way out before you go. He'll love it. Um, uh, but I give the history lesson actually more so to say that, that this sort of event and, the, and what I'm getting ready to say has been kicking around in my head for about these 17 years. And I remember discussing it with Pastor Jeff for the very first time at the original Youngerman Circle building. There's not too many people left, I think, who remember that, but it was the first place we ever met that wasn't a tent. Um, and I, I remember uh, talking to him about this sort of event that, that took place to me. And Andy, if you'll go to the first slide, please. That was maybe the second slide. Um, I was flying back from Washington, uh, D.C., back to Jacksonville, and I had a, a window seat. And, and as the plane took off, and for quite some time, I looked out the window and I noticed that on the ground was this just giant circle of light, just reflecting. And, and as we went, so went the light. And it covered ponds and over roads and over cars and over trees. And no matter where we went, it was there too until we banked a little bit and it went away. I thought, oh, that's cool. And I was getting ready to go on with my life, but God said, no, no, no. Think about that. That was for you. And I spent the rest of the flight through trial and error, mostly error, coming to what he was trying to tell me. And, and the thing of it is, is in this scenario, the, the, the thing that happened that day sort of was this perfect alignment of the sun and reflecting off the ground to the plane and the angle, when the angle changed because the plane banked, it went away. But we're not actually supposed to be in the plane, I think. I think in this angle, and if you go to the next one, where we belong actually in the picture is on the ground and not reflecting the light of the sun as the ground was that day, but reflecting the light of S-O-N, the sun, Jesus, to the rest of the world who happens to be in the plane. And I think that analogy for me, the more I thought about it, was pretty cool because, and I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but us being the ground means we're sort of unnoticed and we're stepped on and we're walked over and nobody really pays attention to us unless... We're able to reflect the light of the Son, Jesus, to the rest of the world. And then we actually become beautiful, and people will take notice. And so what I was talking to Jeff about is this was fine, but how do I align myself with Jesus to actually be able to do that? And a lot of that came in part of what Brian just talked about, but this too was crystallized for me sort of through world events. Um, it was interesting, several weeks ago, Brian mentioned a book by E. Stanley Jones called Christ of the Indian Road. And this sort of locked into place for me while I was literally on a road in India. Uh, India, India, figure out. Thank you. Um, I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the world, mostly with work. Um, and what I have noticed is that in pretty much all places, and especially here in these United States, traffic aggravates us. We don't like people to cut us off. We don't like people going too fast. We don't like people going too slow. We use our horns as weapons and axe 
of vengeance to let them know this. But in India, where actually traffic is worse than you can imagine all the time, every day, that doesn't happen. They, they don't get angry with each other when these things happen. In fact, they don't use their horns as, as, as punishing people. They use them a sweet little toot toot. That means I'm coming over. And, you'll, and I asked my driver, I said, is that the way it goes? He said, yeah, toot toot, they're coming over. And so nobody's angry because they know what's going to happen. And what Brian just sort of explained in that second half is Jesus tells us the world's going to hate you. You will have trouble. And if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, he says they're going to hate you. And once in Matthew, he says essentially the same thing. The world will hate you because of me. Next week in 16, he says a little bit nicer. He says you will have trouble because of me. I think a lot of times we skip over all this because A, the vine and the branch stuff sounds cooler, and, but, but we don't necessarily like the language, I don't think, either, right? We don't think of Jesus telling us about hatred and these kinds of things, but, but it's there. And we already, so we already know. So when it happens, I like to be right. I don't know about you. I like to be right. So I'm by no means suggesting that we go through life in cynicism and just waiting for people to, you know, do us wrong and this, but it's going to happen. So, you know, check. I was right today. That's awesome. Let's do that. But actually, what we'll find out, you know, throughout the entire Bible, really, but around this time, you know, Jesus's response to this isn't just, yeah, I was right, and, and I'm letting you know so you can be right. He chooses to respond by actually being unfair about it. Uh, you know, from the dawn of time, he's saying people will hate you just because you love me. And we would say, well, that's not fair. And what have we said to every kid who ever dared tell us that something wasn't fair since the dawn of time? Life's not fair. But that's, that's not good enough. What he models, uh, a few weeks ago, Jackson you know, walked us through him washing his friend's feet. Nobody does that. In, in, the, in the chapters to come and what we celebrated last Sunday, and if you weren't there or you haven't been paying attention, I'm sorry to spoil it for you, but things are going to go bad for Jesus uh, as we march through John. And he did it on purpose, intentionally lived an unfair life. And so it can be as simple for us to do as not getting angry when the people cut us off, as paying for the people behind us in line. Uh, you know, what I like to have done is, is if you, you're, you're tired from work and you come home and you just want to rest, give that first 30 minutes to your kids or your spouse or your friend anyway. I would challenge you to find a way to intentionally live an unfair life each and every day because it is a bit of the model. It can be that simple. It can be as simple as this also, if you will, Andy. Um, stay with me here, please. <laughs> women, ladies, I'm going to blow your mind because you know we're crazy, but you don't know how crazy. I would submit to you that every man in this room and 99% of the people, the men in the world, when faced with this, would choose the same toilet for the exact same reasons. I won't get into the reasons. Ask a male that you know or ask me afterwards. It's fine. But I'm pretty good on the math here. In fact, I've, I've thought about this way longer than I should because I'm a little weird about it. But probably 10 years ago, I sent this picture to 10 people, geographically, economically dispersed individuals who I happen to know. And I said, which toilet would you choose? And nine of the 10 chose the one on the right. And you're already saying, Ryan, you just told me 99% and you're cutting yourself off at 90 straight away. Not really. Because the 10th person chose the toilet on the left because he knew everyone else wanted the toilet on the right. So he chose, he had every right to the best toilet. He chose the worst toilet intentionally for the good of others. That person was Pastor Jeff, by the way. But so it can be that simple. But it should not be that simple, right? The, Jesus is modeling to kick it up a notch. And here's the point in any sermon where if I'm sitting there, I think, <laughs> of course, Jesus can do it. He's Jesus. I can't, I can't be that good. But there are some good examples from within the Bible where humans have done this as well. And my favorites come from the life of David in Saul. Angie, if you'll go to the next slide, please. And I'll just 
these are up there, but I'll, I'm not going to read this. I'll paraphrase it. Basically, Saul had been named king. Or, sorry, it's the book of Samuel. I said Saul. Saul had been named king. He immediately screwed it up. David then is anointed by uh, David then is anointed by Samuel, but he's still not king. And all he ever tried to do was be good to Saul. He slew giants for him. He played him music when he was upset. He was his best friend's son. And yet still, Saul spent most of his life trying to kill David for really no reason at all. And on several occasions, David had a chance to do something about it. He had caught Saul unaware, whether sleeping in his camp or relieving himself in a cave, as they like to put it. And his friends, I think we would oftentimes say rightfully, said, God has put him here right now so that you can end this. You can, you can kill him, and life moves on. A lot of people would even argue that would accelerate God's plan to actually have David sit as king of Jerusalem, right? But every time, David says, no. No one will lay a hand on my Lord's anointed. So he, he chose to live an unfair life in those own kids, and in fact, used the situation to give some glory to God. And the one that I think is best for me, if you go to the next slide, Andy, is the, the after David actually does ascend to the crown, Saul has died of natural causes and is walking around. And one of Saul's descendants comes and just starts cursing him. Throw every bad word you can think of. They're throwing at him. And David's got good people. So again, they say, you can't do that to him. Let's kill him. But this is the best one. David says this time, how do I know God didn't send him to say those things to me? And it stops me in my tracks every time. Because if you can just remember, th this is sort of the pattern that I think is really helpful. If we can just, number one, Jesus already told us, people are going to screw with us. Why get angry? I like to be right. Do you like to be right? We like to be right. We knew it was going to happen. It happened. Awesome. Number two, intentionally respond by choosing to live an unfair life about it. Respond. As Brian was just saying, he put those up there. Respond with peace and with kindness and with compassion. And then if you are so bold, use that opportunity to even talk about God. And these things work. Just this past Thursday, God was kind enough to reemphasize this for me and say, yeah, you're talking about the right things. I was out at a work function after hours, and one of my colleagues came up to me, and he said, Ryan, I've been meaning to tell you, I've noticed, no matter what happens and how crazy it gets, you're always positive, and you're always calm, and you're always empathetic. How is that so? And I got probably the biggest smile, I'm sure of it, because number one, I knew God was saying, we're okay here. But number two, because I, I, said, I said, you know what, I'm actually preaching about this on Sunday. I'm going to send you the link. I hope you're watching, bud. And then, and then I got to talk about, I said, the short answer is Jesus. And then I got to talk about Jesus. And it was really cool. And I got to talk about Jesus in the most unexpected of place, the most unexpected of ways. And so the point is, if we, if we can somehow just remember, Jesus already told us it's going to happen. Respond by living life unfairly. And in the face of it, be calm, be positive. And use that opportunity to talk about Jesus and God and everything he's done for you. And this is actually why you're able to maintain that level. Then we will, back to that first slide, align ourselves properly with the sun and be able to reflect his light to the world. And they will notice that we, as a Christian people, are beautiful. And there's something going on there. And they're going to want to know what it is. Thank you for the time. And thank all of you. Amen. I'm going to have the band come back up. And uh, let's all stand. Um, I think that, you know, the Lord is, it's, it's pretty clear here, you know, as he's laid it out before us. This is not um, difficult to understand. You know, all of us, this is the kind of thing um, all of us can, should, and will do. And it's not, um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm sitting there like the way we share our faith is this way. It's a, uh, um, it will lead to the conversations, like Ryan said, of who Jesus is and the explanations of what he came to do and all that kind of stuff. 
But at that point, you'll have the credibility to even have that conversation. So I, I, I we brought back, uh, I felt like this song uh, from years and years ago, this You Are So Good To Me song. I want to sing that again as we close. Um, because I think it's it kind of dovetails into this whole thing. that As the vine and us as a branch, we can do all these things in response because Jesus is so good to us. And obviously while we're singing, if you want to come up and, uh, and spend time praying at the altar, that's definitely available. Or if you just want to sing along with us, that'd be great. So I'm going to pray. So Father, I just pray that you would seal this word into our hearts, that we might reflect your glory, and that we would choose an unfair life for your glory, and that you would use that to share your goodness with the world. In your name we pray.